today I want to talk to you about something that appears in the Bible often, and it's a word covenant. A covenant is simply an agreement between two people or two parties. It's where they sit down and they make a promise to each other, and each one has to do something, and if they fail to do it, or if someone doesn't keep the promise, then there will be some kind of forfeit or penalty or consequence. How is a covenant made? Well, sometimes people sit down and they write it all down and both people sign it. But sometimes it can be a lot simpler than this. Here is a picture of a very common covenant. Anyone know what that is? It's a pinky promise or a pinky swear. Two people link their fingers together and say, both of us promise to do this thing or to keep this secret or whatever it is. And if one of them breaks it, then that's pretty serious. Now, you may not know that there's a pretty dark side to the pinky promise, that when it started, the idea was that if one party broke the promise, the other one could break their finger. That's why it was done. Now, thankfully, we don't do that. I think there'd be a lot of upset mums and dads and doctors around if we did do that. But it shows us that promises and covenants are to be taken seriously. Now, the reason I say this is because God, throughout the Bible, wanted covenants with humans. And we talked last week about this man, Abraham. And God not only said to him, you're going to be the father of countless descendants, you're going to be the head of this great nation. And in that 15th chapter of Genesis, as soon as he says this to him, he says, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. He says to him, and I am going to give you a land where all of these people can live. Now, Abraham isn't sure how that's going to happen. So God enters into a covenant with him. Now, God and Abraham, they don't do a pinky promise, but they do the type of covenant that was typical in uh, that area at that time. And what... um, God tells Abraham to do is to go and get some animals. He has to go and get a cow, a ram, and a goat. God tells him to halve the animals. Now, it's not very nice, is it? But he has to cut the animals in half in order that a path might be made between them. And the idea was that both God and Abraham would walk through this path of halved animals. The idea being that if one party failed on the contract, on the agreement, on the covenant, then it would be as if they are saying, may what has been done to these animals be done to me. That's pretty serious, isn't it? It's saying, if I break this contract, you're free to kill me. What was the covenant that God wanted with Abraham? It was simply this. God said, I want to be your God, and I want you and all these people that belong to you to be my people. And God says, here's what I'll do. I will provide for you. I will bless you. I will protect you from your enemies. I will give you everything you need. I will bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. And he said to Abraham, this is your part of the bargain. You have to follow me and do what I say. Keep my commands. And so Abraham agrees to do this, and he's there waiting for God to show up so that God and he might walk through together. And the day goes on a long time, and Abraham has to spend the day uh, shooing off the birds of prey from the animals here, until finally it becomes nighttime. And still God hasn't come. But before God arrives, what he does is he causes Abraham to fall into a very deep sleep. Now, thankfully, there's a nice pillow-shaped rock down here for him there. And then, when Abraham is in his deep sleep, something happens. God appears. Now, God appears in the form of a fire pot. We might call it a fire pit, but it's like a fire pot or a a burning brazier, and smoke is coming out of it. And God alone walks through the path in the form of this burning pot. He goes all the way through and makes the covenant with Abraham, but never makes Abraham walk through the path. Why doesn't God make Abraham do it? Because he knows he'll fail. He knows he's human. He knows he's sinful. He knows the first chance Abraham gets, he's going to mess the covenant up, and God doesn't want to kill him. Now, the amazing thing for me is that God makes a covenant with all of us. God says to us, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. This is serious. He says, I want us to be in an eternal relationship with each other. It's so crucial to God. 
And God says the same thing. Let's make this covenant. But he knows that we can't keep it. He knows that we couldn't agree to this covenant because we would fail every day because of the sins that are in us. We've done that, haven't we? We have broken the covenant day after day after day. We should be treated like those animals. Did God kill us? No. Who died because the covenant got broken? God died. Isn't that an incredible thing? We talk about the God of the Old Testament as if he's some terrible ogre. But the God of the Old Testament is a God of love and passion and care and grace and mercy who calls us into a relationship with us. He says to us, I alone make the covenant. I alone will walk the path. And I alone will act as if I was the one who broke the covenant when he never did. He never broke the covenant once throughout history. But God says, let it be done to me what has been done to those animals. When was that happened? When Jesus went to the cross. When he died, when he gave up his life having done nothing wrong, that he might bear our sins, that he might take our punishment, and that we might be reconciled to God, that he might be our God, and we might be his people. I love these Old Testament stories because they point us to a God who is crying out to us on every single page, not just the New Testament, but Jesus is there in every page of the Old saying, come into a relationship with me. God has done everything that is needed to make it work. And if God is giving that invitation, respond to it today.